The Cloud Foundry Foundation is our sponsor here for our podcast from the Cloud Foundry Summit in Santa Clara, California. Our discussion, the path emerging as organizations move beyond the confusion and disruption and take the journey to transformation. We'll explore the new concepts of multi-cloud and how it relates to open source app development and management at scale. Cloud Foundry gives companies the speed, simplicity, and control they need to develop and deploy applications faster and easier. Learn more about Cloud Foundry at cloudfoundry.org. Hi, this is Lee Calco with the New Stack. We're, we're here at the Cloud Foundry Summit in Santa Clara, California. I'm joined by a couple of esteemed colleagues this afternoon, Dr. Nick Williams of Dark and Wayne, as well as Edith Levine of, of EMC. Welcome, guys, to the show. Thanks for being here. Take a moment to introduce yourselves, if you would. I'm Dr. Nick Williams. Uh, as CEO of Stack & Wayne, we are a consulting company to help people bring up and run Cloud Foundry. Uh, in addition, you know, developers who get to use Cloud Foundry, the very lucky ones, you know, make sure they are successful. And, and but we do, it, That's our long-term mission, is to make sure developers get to be successful. Get to be lucky. Nice. Yeah. And I'm Edith Levin from EMC, so I'm working in the CTO office, and I'm actually reporting to John Ross, who is the chair of Cloud Foundry so a Foundation. I also work at the CTO of EMC Cloud Foundry Dojo in Cambridge. So, and what we're doing is a lot of very safe stuff in Cloud Foundry, like for instance, the Rec HD implementation, persistent adding to Cloud Foundry. But we're also doing some advanced development projects, like for instance, Unikernel and LayerX and other projects. That I love speaking with, with CTOs and people in the CTO office. You guys just have, it's just like a playground. And so speaking of lucky developers, I think you know, there, there are some that get to play in, in that type of a playground. And, uh, Cloud Foundry seems to provide that for, for some, a playground, but also we were talking earlier with some other folks that were trying to bring policy and governance to Cloud Foundry. And so, Edito, just kind of on that notion of playground and, and various um, initiatives that you guys have, I think you know, both of you guys, um, Dr. Nick and Edith, uh, are speaking at the conference, and I think you're hot off the podium, um, Edith. So just, you know, unikernels and, you know, unique. I think, I think you guys have an announcement somewhere in there. What, what's that all about? Yeah, so uh, as part of the Advanced Development Project, we created a project called Unique. And what's special about this project is when we went and looked at Unikernel, we really, really liked the architecture. We saw that it makes sense for a lot of cloud uh, applications that are running there and a lot of very, very good fit for Internet of Things. And, uh, but it's very hard to do, and therefore people are not really using it. And it's actually exactly the same that it was for the Linux container before Docker made, make it easy to use. So what we did, we basically decided to do kind of like a Docker for Unikernel. So we created some project that it's open source by EMC. Um, and, uh, and, and what we basically just make it very, very easy and seamless for the user to build Unikernel and run them on a variety of uh, cloud and also an embedded device. Well, that's very interesting. Actually, there's probably a lot of promise just, you know, I can't. Part of your talk earlier today. Can I represent everyone that doesn't know what Unikernel does? <laughs> Can I do that? that I'll, I'll be that guy. <laughs> Can you go through what they are relative to containers? And, yeah. yeah. So the idea with Unikernel is that if you're looking at the stack today that you're running, you're running hypervisor, you're running on a hardware, then you have the hypervisor, the hypervisor drivers, then you have, you're putting the operating system on top of it. In the operating system, you have the kernel, you have the OS processes, then usually you're putting container on top of it, right? And then on the container, you're putting your libraries, you're putting your, uh, there is a lot, a lot, a lot of, of layer on the stack. What Unicanal is doing, they say all of this is not necessary because in the end of the day, what we're trying to do is run a very single application with a single user on a single server. So what basically Unicanal is doing, they said, let's start from the application. Let's see what you, the application really need. So if it's not need driver for USB because you're running on the cloud, it's not going to be there. If you don't need a driver for floppy, it's not going to be there because no one is using floppy anymore. So basically, it's taking only what it's need. It's running on kernel mode, which means that the application is basically compiled to the operating system, running on, so you don't have all the content switch and all the, it's all running on the user, you know, the, the difference between the user kernel and the, the user mode and the kernel mode, it's all running on the kernel mode. So you're getting very killer performance, yep. very light, it, it's, there's not a lot of storage, there's not a lot of size, we're talking about case instead of gig, very fast to boot because there's not a lot of line to boot. And uh, the last thing is that very secure because the surface of attack is very, very small, right? So for all the fans of Docker out there, when they, if they were told to go and use Unikernels, what would they be giving up in that transition? So one, one limitation that uh, Unikernel has today is by far the, the fact that you're running one process, which means that you cannot fork. If you have an application that's forking, you cannot run it in Unikernel. 
So that's the only limitation that there is right now. There is people that tend to say that it's also not mature, therefore it's very hard to debug. But that's actually not, not entirely correct because when we build Unique, we actually had to debug it. And therefore we actually, right now, we, we did it manually and now we, we adding to Unique the feature of debugging uh, automatically. So you will be able to just attach debugger to a Unique kernel and look at it. We are not going to, to give them much. I mean, we are, they're not going to lose much if they weren't going to run Unique kernel, but they will get a lot of benefit for security and, uh, and, and again, storage. that It's free out something and, and so on. So it's actually better. Is there a way that we get to, that we here at the Cloud Foundry Conference, I do see a push. Is there a way in which yes. I get to use Unique? The funny thing is that when we started with Unique kernel, the first thing that we did, we integrated with Docker. And the reason we did that is because we know that the community actually really dig, really, really like and adopt the Docker API. So what we did, we teach Unique to speak Docker, which means that you can right now target a daemon of Unique and basically just run Docker PS. You will get all the Unique on the running and so on. So that's the first thing that we did. But our, our goal was always to integrate it with Cloud Foundry because that's the best platform out there today. So what we did, we, that's exactly what we did today. Okay. We added a, a plugin to the CLI called Enable Unique. So right now, if you're running, uh, if you want to push your application to Cloud Foundry and run it on Unique kernel, that seamless will going to happen. You're going to leverage all the functionality that Cloud Foundry is already giving you today, like services and all of this. All of this will work with proxy and. Oh, sorry. I have so many more questions. Um, okay. so currently Cloud Foundry, you can do the CF push of a, of like source code or a compiled Java and it will go through the build pack process. Yes. There's also the, the CF push of a Docker image, and you can go with that. If, I, if the back end is unikernels, which of those two paths, or is there a third path? So the source. The source oh. is the one that we're So we still, still the same build packs? Yeah. Is it the same build packs or a different stem? Is it a different we sort created of a build. We get, created a big build pack, and uh, when you're running Unique, you're telling him which type of uh, compiler you want to use, because you need to say which cloud provider you want to run on, right? If, I, if I'm pushing a Ruby on Rails application, or a Go app, or a Java app, yeah. it's not going to pick up the standard build packs. No, it will pick up the unique build pack, right. and one of the arguments that will be there will tell him that you need to run uh, Ruby and Rel, and we're supporting it, so it's just going to compile. So, so, so the build packs also have things other than, here's Ruby, they also have, you know, picking up, like creating a, a database.yaml file or a Spring Boot type thing. Mm -hmm. does, does your build pack have those features? Yeah, we're supporting everything that, it, you know, everything that Cloud Foundry will support, we, we can support as well. We didn't do that, but we can. It's not a problem. That's a great uh, approach in terms of um, leveraging the, the knowledge and kind of momentum that systems like, like Docker bring. The developers certainly love the CLI. It's, it's easy to use. And being able to, like you said, teach Unique that, that Docker CLI, that's the, I think, to what Dr. Nick was just asked, or clarification for me is you guys teach uh, unique Cloud Foundry, so to speak? So the integration with Cloud Foundry is more complicated than Docker because uh, in Docker, we're just translating the API. In the integration and the unique in, in Cloud Foundry, we actually, it's much more complicated. We, we need to change a few codes. What were the extension points? The biggest sort of system-wide you know, nursing of an app. So what are those extension points? You know, what were the hooks, like logs? So what do we do? So yeah, so the first thing that we did is, uh, is the build pack, right? That's the first thing that you need to do. And, and to, to add a CLI plugin. That's the things, first thing that we needed to do. But then what we're doing, we're actually leveraging Diego, and we're running our own code inside a doc, uh, Diego container to actually manage the Unikernel. So Unikernel is running outside the platform. And, and the way it's working is that the, there is three functionality to the code that we created. The first one is that it's going to monitor it. So once the application, the, it's going to ping it, once the Unikernel is down, it's going to kill the container. And Diego will realize that and create a new one. That's the first thing. The second thing that we, going, that we did is basically we are streaming the log from the Unikernel itself to the log aggregator. So now we can actually do application logs and see everything. The last thing that we did is it's, it's a proxy. And the idea with that is that Cloud Foundry already have proxy. So once it's coming to the container, we're hopping it up to the Unicron that you will be able to see that. Mm -hmm. So basically, that way you can actually continue leveraging for the load balance and all the routing functionality of Cloud Foundry. So I, I'll now represent our customers, right? So okay. the GEs of the world who've got a Cloud Foundry, they're excited about it, it's working. If I was going to try and convince them to think about it, why would they take the thing that's working? to go and say them. switch in a, a new kernel. So as I said, I mean, I think that it depends what is the application, but what you the, the three quality that it's very important in, in, uh, in a unicorn, like we said, is the size, right? There is a lot of bit and byte that you don't need to put there and you are paying for storage. Do you have an example of the size change? Like, say, running a Java app? So, I mean, as I said to you, we're running, I will give you an example. So when Unique uh, is actually booting up, 
if it's running in a, in a infrastructure that doesn't have, that is not owning the DNS, for instance, if it's running on EXSI, it, it cannot know what is the IP address because we were not running VM tools inside the Unikernel. And therefore, we need to get somehow. So what we did, we created kind of like a small Unikernel. Actually, it's Unikernel DNS. And this is 300 meg. So like it's a DNS, it's a real DNS. It probably will be, I don't know, a few gigs, you know, of VM if you want to do it in VM. And we're doing it in 300 meg. And that DNS is used for service <laughs> discovery? Is that what the DNS is focused on, is service discovery as new unit kernels come up yeah. and they announce it? Yes, because we do need to know the IP address. So it's basically broadening, broadcasting it, and then it's getting the IP. Is there, is there the option to then use you know, something like etcd or console or you know, zookeeper? Not to get the IP as far as I know. Okay, or just in terms of like service discovery? Yeah, um, we just need the IP. At the end of the day, right, we just, it's the same layer of container. We need to know what is the IP for, for people to get no like, Discovery that there's one of these this, this DNS kernel by Unikernel is that one per container or nope. one for the environment? Yeah, okay, okay so that, that exists uh, that's part of the sub the infrastructure of the platform. Yeah, what, what, what has changed if I've got a, a so we run Garden in the Cloud Foundry, so if I've got a Java app built by the build pack that's running Java and, and other things that are in there, what's the footprint that that has? And what does that go to? So, I mean, again, it depends. Like, I'm running a Go web, website, for instance. It, it's seriously like that's case, right? So, the question is again, what is your application? Right, basically, so because Java Unikernel, is already big, it doesn't yeah. feel so impressive. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, I'm sorry for not giving you this. <laughs> no, no, no. But, but all I'm trying to say is that. Uh, let's do the go, yeah. go one. All right. I'm yeah, happy to play again. All right. Let's say the Go one, right? How big is a Go app, really? And how, how, how big is that so, additional? So, what you need to understand is that your application, your Unikernel size is basically kind of like the application size because we're adding nothing with right. the Unikernel. So as big as your application. So what is the kernel? What is the, yeah, what what is is it the for? size? Because weren't we like, so, we were tell, we've were we been telling the story about containers are so lightweight compared to VMs. Right. We haven't really even finished ingesting that. So what was that footprint? So so again, it depends what you're running there, right? No, 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 I mean, outside of the thing you're running. What, the stuff that you're running well, outside? I assume, yeah, I assume, I assume the application, that Go app, is still the same size. Yes. So, but but the problem else. is all the stuck that you're running on, right. right? You're running on Ubuntu. On top of it, you're running this. All of these things is going to shrink up. But if I'm running 50 container and you're taking one node for Ubuntu, mm -hmm. I don't know which machine you're going to take. A big instance in Amazon or something like that? Probably like this, right? You know, we need to... Like what you, you've said it's smaller. You said you yeah, I mean, I mean in, the end of, in the end of the day, you don't have the operating <laughs> system, right? Yeah. So the operating system is done. It's so, okay, so you on, don't so have you, the container. So, okay, so, all right, so let's go to the Bosch story then. How do I bring up this, this Diego cell? That's running. That's also supporting unikernels. Or how? What is my deployment story for this? So for that, it means that you don't need to come to bring a cell, right? Theoretically, you don't need to a cell. I, I saw. The, okay, if I deploy to Amazon or vSphere or yeah, so maybe Mute or Azure, I'm bringing up they sell VMs. Yes. Or do I bring up something else that's not a VM? No, no, no. So you bring VM. the regular VM, but, but you're not, not bringing the Ubuntu, cell. Yeah. So mm -hmm. instead of Ubuntu, I bring up something else? You're not bringing everything. Cloud Foundry will create it for you. No, no, no. Okay. No, no, no. So, there's, so we start with nothing. Right? Okay. And Bosch says, I'd like to bring up Cloud Foundry. But right. instead of Cloud Foundry with Diego cells, the old-fashioned ones yes. that have only just come out, struggling <laughs> with this idea that we're, we're already busy replacing things. But... I will use old fashioned. You know, so Bosch asks for those machines and right. they're a bunch of machines. Right. And then it will put Diego bits. So in. so the way we architect it right now, which is not the right architecture, I wanna say already the integration, we didn't work, it's not production ready whatsoever. We're still using Diego, right? So you will need the self Diego. Probably almost nothing is running inside, so you don't need a big one, but you still need to run it there, right? Now, the only thing that it's doing is monitoring the, the, the Unicorn. And the Unicorn itself of VM that Cloud Foundry will spin when you're pushing the application. So is the, is the Unikernel something that's... I'd like to pretend this is my ignorance. Luckily, my ignorance matches probably many people listening, so I'll continue <laughs> to, uh, to espouse my ignorance. Is the Unikernel functionality something that's already on an Ubuntu no, VM? No, 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 no. It's a VM. It's a VM. It's a bootable image. That's the result. Okay, yeah, okay. We, so, we, so we, go, we go to the Amazon marketplace, so to speak, yes. and instead of bringing up an Ubuntu AMI, there is a Unikernel. You're not even bringing it out. What we're doing is when we're building it, we're creating you an AMI. So instead of Bosch doing this, yes. you're doing it. Unicorn is doing it. Exactly. Like a unique is doing it. It's not the right architecture. It's not the cleanest okay. architecture, but as I said, this is the way we did it right now. When a new app comes up, you go back to, to, to Amazon and ask for, for what, okay, what so, we're doing so if, behind right, the so, scene. That's right. So if Bosch isn't bringing up these things, yeah. then your system is, is it then going back to that infrastructure to ask for 
yes, things to buy. Yes, Unique itself is basically going and uh, you need to give them what is the cloud provider right. and it's going and it's running it for you. So okay, you compile so it, it for So it will bring up, let's just go with Amazon, yeah. since I think most people can match yeah. that to something. You, I go and do a CF push. Yes. It does the build pack thing. It, ha it needs a container, a, a, a place to do that. So UniK goes off to yeah. Amazon and asks for a VM of one of its standard instances. It's building files. it, then it's streaming the volume, creating a Unic a, a, a AMI and attach it. So now you have an, a, an AMI with a, bootable, with a bootable volume, right? All right. How long does that take? No, no I mean, it's Amazon depends, is not fast, right? It like, depends about your application, right? But no, I can show you a demo. Be, a lot of that's yeah. going to be the Amazon API. Like, it takes time to ask Amazon for stuff. But think what we're asking. We're almost not asking anything. We're asking for the volume. We're asking for a VM. That just tell me, how long does it take to, how long do you have to go to I mean, we did it in a demo right now. How much time yeah. it took? Like, uh, I don't know. I don't know, minutes? Like, two minutes, one minute? To bring up. I think. Yeah. So that's the same for a normal VM, right? Yes. So, okay. Yes. So then... That's the build pack part, and now you've got an AMI instead of a... Uh, so instead of a slug or a droplet, you have an AMI. Yes. That's the match. And then you go and you do scale five. Right? Yes. So then you, you go and ask Amazon for five more things. Yes. You know, instance Basically, I'm, I'm, I'm just booting for AMI, which is very quick, right? Right. It's nothing. It's like second. Yeah, you, you know what? I mean, I, I may not have ever made the distinction between how long to take yeah. Amazon to give me the thing... And then how long is it I can show you them and demonstrate it and you will see that no. it's, it's not, it's not, it's not uh, taking so long. But think about what you're gaining. So um, wait, okay, so yeah. can we go and move? So we, I know you did the demo in yeah. Cloud Foundry, but now I, I'm matching this whole thing to being, like I said, Bosch. Can, can we have a Bosch CPI we, we or a stem about it, cell actually. or whatever? Funny enough, we, we, so when we started, that's what we thought. Oh my God, it would be quick. I Imagine. know, I know, I know. But the reason we didn't do that is because when we look at the functionality of the Bosch, that we at least thought about it, one of the things that he's doing is monitoring with the agent. You cannot put agent inside Unicorn. It just doesn't make sense. So we need to put it outside. The second thing is configuration management. Again, it doesn't make sense to configure manage, manage uh, Unicorn. So again, that's not going to work. And uh, what else? There was like three things that I remember that we, that we said that. And none of them fit perf was perfect fit for Unicorn. So we said, you know what? That's the wrong way. It's just the wrong way to, to put it there. I know that it makes sense because, you know, VM. So immediately we said, oh, Bosch, right? All right I must no admit, I'm, I'm now atta yeah. attra attracted to the idea of how fast they come up. With yeah, so actually, actually, we talked about it with Dimitri. Yeah. And he also said, oh, we can do that. But as I said, we actually thought of doing it and we decided not to because we felt that, um, again, it's, it's a VM. But... It's also a type two of application right. package, right? Oh, sorry, sorry, it's already the application Dimitri itself. Dimitri is the product manager and long-term product manager for yeah. Bosch. Um, mm. Okay, okay. So we're back to Cloud Foundry, and yeah. now, okay. so now, when I bring up as an operator, I bring up Cloud Foundry. I don't need to bring up 50, 50 VMs to run Diego. You don't. All right. So one. One, one only one, because because you've got some bits yeah, of data. Yeah, 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 yeah. And your thing is now going to go off. So it's when I do a CF push and I say that I only need sixty meg, sixty-four megabytes for my Go app. Yeah. There, there is no 64 megabytes Amazon instance. Oh, that's interesting. That's very interesting. You're right. So actually, Unicanal, it's actually not a good fit for Amazon. Right. That's why we did immediately the integration with OpenStack with, uh, with, uh, and, and with the uh, okay, EXSI. So places EXSI. where you get to control your, your image exactly. all the way down. But another work that we did is in EMC, there is a cloud called VirtuStream. And in VirtuStream, there is the notion of a uh, micro VM, which basically you're paying only for what you're using. Right. Mm -hmm. So we went and did this integration because there it actually makes sense to run it. So, so that's what we did. But on the private cloud, EXSI, OpenStack, it's just going to work and you, you're going to save a lot of you know, There are a number of benefits of, of unikernels, and I think that's kind of in part where you know, Dr. Nick was um, digging into. Yeah. Part of it, what's interesting is just sort of you know, taking note of your EMC badge and, and sort of the storage that, that you guys sell and represent. That one of those benefits is just smaller footprint. Right. And I guess I wanted to come to understand how that's how EMC how that you know benefits EMC. Um, can I can I answer that? Like, <laughs> that way, if I answer it, it doesn't sound <laughs> like she's you know, sure. Because I think EMC, uh, so vSphere or VMware went through a similar internal mental challenge, unsuccessfully, I think. Right, like Warden came out of VMware. Right, so the container technology that historically predates Docker came out of VMware. And the urban legend from, you know, stories you hear is that the VMware people didn't know what to do with it. It looked like competition to their product. Like, why would you want to use less? Why would you, this sort of why question. So, and it turns out that if you, you know, there's a, just a natural forcing function. We are all going to be doing more and we are going to want to use less. But in the end, we buy more. You know, Amazon is a behemoth, right? 
they made it easier to buy less, and in, in, in the consequence was you end up buying more. Mm. And I think that's, that would be my interpretation of the playbook. I agree, and also I think that DMC is all about innovation. We really, really want to be a leader in the innovation community, and this is something I think that we are ahead of everybody, yeah. right? I mean, which is great, because uh, we have suddenly uh, approach from Docker and from Deeper Panic and other companies that are actually really, really into cooperate on this. And I think that would be very useful for you. I, I agree. And I, I think that's in part where Dr. Nick's questions stem from is just the notion that, hey, we, we just, you know, we just got done kind of understanding containers and there's new initiatives around those for certain companies. And Dr. Nick's, you know, at Stark and, and Wayne, they're all about, you know, helping, helping people get up and deploy and run, you know, at scale Cloud Foundry deployments. And so, you know, have just as you've engaged with your customers, you know, to what extent does Docker or even Unikernels kind of come into any of the conversations with, with your customers? So Cloud Foundry represents a, a, a horizontal slice of a change that doesn't even start with technology, right? You know, there's this whole, you know, most businesses, a lot of the ones here at the conference are represented like they have this whole environmental shift going on in their space. And if, if they don't do something about changing in part their own identity internally of what it is they make, but also how they make it and that say, we need to make software, we need to you know, listen to Allstate and everyone. That's all, it's human beings changed. And so Cloud Foundry is just a layer. So I say all that because a lot of them are still spending a lot of brain cycles just in the, in the space above the technology. I think it's going, to, it's going to be important that we gradually give them the right things at the right time without necessarily they're going to have to ask the question, why unikernels? Uh -huh. hopefully, hopefully whoever they're working with and provide them the right answers and evolve them over time. They've got a lot of other ch challenges. This conference is yeah. not just about should you or mm -hmm. should you use Cloud Foundry. It's like, do you want to be a Fortune 500 country in five, 15 years or, or have you had enough fun? Yeah. You know? I wanted to say that uh, um, regarding the Unicorn, I think that the advantage of Unicorn is the fact that you basically don't need to change. If you think about it, this is VM, right? You're running on your hypervisor, you're getting all the benefit of container, but still running uh, a very mature hypervisor technology. So I think it's the best of all the world. It's much more secure, but as I said, so all the problem of container are not apply for it, but you're still running unit, basically a VM. So whatever you did before, you can continue doing. And I think this is like... You know, speaking of continuing doing things, there's applications that, you know, today, you know, and, and applications from yesterday and today that need, that are stateful and have, you know, storage mm -hmm. needs. And there have been a number of areas that organizations have had to come to understand better in a containerized world and in a unikernel world about things like security, how does that change and how do they take, you know, how do they write applications that are, how do they deal with, you know, persistence and that type of a need. And so from a unikernel's perspective and sort of from an EMC perspective, how are the needs of persistence uh, met within when someone deploys unikernels? Or so, so the beauty of this is that Unik is supporting storage volumes. And basically, as I said, it's a VM, so we didn't need to invent it. The other thing that I think that is important is that we actually added it to Cloud Foundry as well. So we went and changed the, BB, uh, the BS, BBS, right? Uh, the, uh, yeah, the Diego yeah, BBS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we basically changed change it to support persistence. So right now you can run Unikernel with persistent, with volume, and if you lose this Unikernel, Cloud Foundry will know to spin a new one and also attach the, the volume. So it's actually, I think, all... Only this is very cool innovation that we did around that. So, so yeah, so I mean, as I said, we, we, it's cool because you're getting the, the old style VM quality with vMotion, with DRS, and everything that, for instance, VMware is giving you out of the box, but you're running much small footprint and you're getting the performance and the security of the container and security that it's of the VM, which is perfect. It is interesting. I, I, you can hear I, I come from a primary, you know, I've started in an Amazon mindset which may help from the perspective of anyone listening. There may be a subset that come from that space. There's going to be a subset that come from a, a vSphere or a virtual stream sort of space. And so it may be interesting, yeah. The benefits may evolve differently based on, you know, who and where you, you can get your VMs. But on the other hand, it may help people pick different, you know, there's still a cloud war going on. Mm -hmm. And it may be interesting to see if the not Amazons of the world pick up unikernels and make a more, you know, granular unikernel-based offering as, you know, as a way of getting marketplace. Yeah. So as I said, Unique is also running on embedded device. So um, what, so this is a kind of cool because but you, it's, it's, we work very nicely with the Internet of Things. So that way it can position Cloud Foundry as an Internet of Things. It's already kind of like, but you can actually boot It can uh, actually be the things. Yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> it can be like Not a, just the back end for the Internet of exactly. Things. It can be the things. Exactly. So I think it's very, very cool. 
Wow. What a breadth of uh, potential disruption for, uh, for unikernels going forward. So, Dr. Nick, it's good, good that you guys are, are now connected so that, you know, three years from now, as, uh, as the next thing comes out, you can be you know, helping customers with, with unikernels, and then uh, we'll have nano kernels. You're, you're going to want dual kernels. You're going to want, you know, <laughs> one kernel won't be enough. You want a second one to help it along. So we're here at the Cloud Foundry Summit. Um, I did want to, you know, thank you guys for joining the show. This has been uh, extremely enlightening, I know, for me. And I'm glad I could co-host it yeah. with you to ask, <laughs> yeah. ask her all these questions. Yeah, and also I, I really invite everybody to uh, follow us in Twitter, like uh, Project Unique. And also, um, it's, as I said, its source is open, so let's just go look at the GitHub. It's, uh, it's all written in Go, very clean. And for anyone who's listening and has a mobile phone and has still not figured out the spelling of Unique, it is. Oh, it's a U-N-I-K. Very good. They have something to group. Well, thank you, Dr. Nick. I appreciate you being on. Thank you, Deet. Um, thank you so good much. Good to have you guys. Us. The Cloud Foundry Foundation is our sponsor here for our podcast from the Cloud Foundry Summit in Santa Clara, California. Our discussion, the path emerging as organizations move beyond the confusion of disruption and take the journey to transformation. We'll explore the new concepts of multi-cloud, and how it relates to open source app development and management at scale. Cloud Foundry gives companies the speed, simplicity, and control they need to develop and deploy applications faster and easier. Learn more about Cloud Foundry at cloudfoundry.org.